Hi, my name is Dylan Stern, and I'm excited today to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and to bring you some of the science going on right now to help us better understand and take care of our planet. At the Delta Science Program, we are charged with providing the best possible unbiased scientific information to inform water and environmental decision making in the Delta. One of our key objectives in carrying out that mission is to initiate, evaluate, and fund research that will fill critical gaps in our understanding of the current and ever-changing Bay Delta system. After all, if environmental managers and state decision makers don't have access to the science they need to answer critical questions about managing our natural resources, they're essentially flying the plane without any radar. So in the spirit of Earth Day, I'd like to share with you some of the science being conducted in the Delta which plays an important role in helping to contribute to a healthier, more resilient planet. The Delta exists at the convergence of Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers in Northern California. The Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is part of the largest estuary on the west coast of the Americas, spanning more than 700,000 acres, or roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. It also supplies a portion of the water used by two-thirds of Californians, or about 27 million people. The Delta also supports over 3 million acres of farms that deliver food at home and abroad. The Delta is also a unique biodiversity hotspot in California, one where fresh water from the mountain runoff meets salt water from the San Francisco Bay and Pacific Ocean. Its thousands of miles of meandering waterways and surrounding lands create ideal habitat for more than 750 plant and animal species. Furthermore, many species of birds, including waterfowl and sandhill cranes, and also fish such as the Chinook salmon, Delta smelt, Central Valley steelhead, and green sturgeon all depend on habitats in and around the estuary for survival. With all of that said, it's no surprise that the Delta and its resources, like the water that moves through it, are of major statewide, national, and even international importance. The scale of benefits that the Delta generates for humans and the environment underscores the importance of good stewardship. And a key component of stewardship is conducting science to inform management decisions. The Delta was formed thousands of years ago, and for much of its existence, it was stewarded primarily by the indigenous people of California. Beginning roughly 150 years ago, an influx of Europeans and Americans, brought by the promise of the gold rush, began reshaping and engineering the Delta and its waterways. This re-engineering, coupled with rapid urban and agricultural growth in this part of California, have led to a number of major changes in the Delta, including water diversions and changes in flow patterns, large-scale conversion of wetlands to channels and levees, changes in the distribution and abundance of native and endemic animals and plants, the introduction of invasive species and pollution from urban and agricultural areas. These changes in turn have had direct impacts on cultural resources, as well as the activities that we enjoy in and around the Delta, including recreational fishing, boating, and swimming. Because the stakes to people and the environment are so high, it's imperative that we take a science, fact-based approach to figure out effective ways to manage the Delta and maintain its numerous valuable services. One of the key services to maintain in the Delta is water quality to ensure a healthy and resilient ecosystem. In order to properly manage water quality, we rely on wastewater treatment plants. They are important tools for treating the water from urban and commercial sources that often contains organic material, nutrients, bacteria, and toxic substances. Treatment processes remove most of these, and then the water is returned to the environment. Other major sources of pollution include stormwater and agricultural runoff, which wash into the delta during rainstorms and may negatively impact habitat for fish, birds, invertebrates, and of course, all the human uses of the Delta. But not all wastewater treatment plants are created equal. There are three general levels of wastewater treatment, depending on the original quality of the water and its intended final use. A typical wastewater treatment process consists of primary treatment to remove solid material, followed by secondary treatment that removes organic material and nutrients, and sometimes a disinfection step. Tertiary treatment involves advanced polishing steps such as filtration, membranes, and ozone treatment. Now, the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District, or Regional SAN, their wastewater treatment plant is the largest in the Delta and it's the largest inland discharger west of the Mississippi. It processes about 130 million gallons of wastewater daily, which would fill nearly 200 Olympic-sized swimming pools each day. 
a combination of physical, chemical, and biological treatment processes considered secondary treatment, remove most pollutants from the wastewater. Since going online in 1982, Regional Sand has demonstrated an excellent record of regulatory compliance and its commitment to protecting the environment and public health. Over 10 years ago, emerging and controversial science suggested that wastewater from the Regional Sand Wastewater Treatment Plant resulted in excess nutrients flowing into the Sacramento River, and that the nutrient ammonium has a negative effect on beneficial phytoplankton, or tiny plants in the water that make up the base of the food web. And this in turn was linked to the decline of the Delta smelt and other native fishes. It is widely agreed, however, that the amount of phytoplankton in the Delta itself has declined significantly in recent decades. And this is a major stressor for the parts of the food web like zooplankton, mussels, and fish that rely on this food source. This prompted the Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board to issue a new wastewater discharge permit requiring significant treatment plant upgrades. Since 2015, Regional San has embarked on a $1.7 billion infrastructure improvement project entitled the Echo Water Project. This project involves enhancing the current secondary treatment process and adding a tertiary level of treatment. Treated water discharged to the Sacramento River will soon contain 65% less organic, inorganic nitrogen and about 93% less ammonia. By 2021, this is expected to result in the largest change in recent decades to nutrient dynamics in the Sacramento River and the Delta. Today, I wish to tell you about Operation Baseline, an effort to establish some baseline data on water quality and the food web before the wastewater treatment plant upgrade in order to answer key questions about the potential impacts of the upgrade on the environment. Peter Drucker, an influential thinker on business and management, is attributed with saying, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So there are various ideas about what might happen to water quality and the food web following the upgrade, some of which are actually at odds with each other. If it is true that ammonium is having a negative effect on beneficial phytoplankton, the upgrade could improve phytoplankton production because the ammonium will be reduced, which could help imperiled fish populations. However, researchers think that it is nearly impossible to directly measure benefits to fish populations due to the reduction in nutrients alone. So, science focused on nutrients and the lower levels of the food web may have a better chance of detecting the link. And on the other hand, recent science suggests that murky water and invasive clams eating phytoplankton are actually what make it hard for phytoplankton to grow. So in that case, the reduction in nitrogen after the upgrade could actually limit phytoplankton growth. Operation Baseline is capitalizing on this natural experiment by monitoring and analyzing environmental characteristics before and after this wastewater treatment plant upgrade. So you might be wondering, why should you care? Well, if you live in the Sacramento region, the ratepayer dollars are contributing toward the upgrade. And if you live in the Delta, you may be curious about how your environment will change. For example, the reduction in nutrients might limit harmful algal blooms, or HABs, which have become a growing problem over the last two decades. HABs produce toxins that make people and animals sick. Both HABs and invasive aquatic weeds are a nuisance for recreation, navigation, and animal habitats in the Delta. Many factors influence HABs and invasive weeds, including water flows and temperature, but the upgrade may reduce the severity of these problematic plants. And if you live in other parts of California, it's very likely that this upgrade will benefit the water that you drink or recreate. The Delta Science Program and other partners have funded a number of scientific components that make up Operation Baseline. And they include a conceptual framework that organizes different ideas or hypotheses about how the reduced nutrients in the Delta might cause changes in the occurrence of HABs or invasive aquatic vegetation and in the amount and quality of phytoplankton. Also, coordinated sampling at the base of the food web, including flow, nutrients, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and aquatic vegetation. So field sampling that includes multiple elements and sampling teams can better capture the connections between these related elements and tell a more holistic story. The U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS, recently tested a new type of sensor that can measure the phytoplankton community quickly and at the same time as nutrients are measured. An array of water quality sensors was used on a boat and flow-through system to literally map changes in the nutrients across the delta on a fine scale, understanding the amount of nutrients 
and type of phytoplankton in the water tells us whether the food web is changing for better or worse. New work directly utilizes new technologies to better understand fine-scale delta-wide changes in nutrients and the resulting shifts in phytoplankton using a combination of stationary measurements and the boat-based flow-through system. This data is collected at a time and spatial scale that is relevant to how quickly nutrients and phytoplankton change in the delta. And such information can produce powerful maps that illuminate these major differences, hotspots, and changes in nutrients and phytoplankton. USGS also developed new methods and tools to measure nutrients in the sediment, their forms, and their movements in and out of the bottom floor of the delta. Sediment may play a key role in controlling nutrient levels in water, but we have very little information on it. And this is a key gap for modeling nutrients and their impacts on the delta. The Delta Science Program has also recently funded another modeling effort that includes USGS, the Virginia Institute for Marine Sciences, VIMS, and the Department of Water Resources, who together will tie together enormous data sets on nutrients, invasive aquatic vegetation, and phytoplankton. And this can, for example, advance our understanding and potential management of the anticipated changes in invasive aquatic vegetation. Also, BSA Environmental Services will soon be analyzing picoplankton, or very small phytoplankton, samples coming from across the delta. Currently, there's very little data on these very little phytoplankton, which may have a disproportionately large role in the food web. So there are many efforts around the world that have studied water quality and the archaeological effects of upgrading wastewater treatment plants. However, this effort is quite unique because of the exciting new technologies being used and tested, and because the complexity of the delta means that there are a number of potential unknown outcomes for the food web. With Operation Baseline, our hope is that researchers will collect as much information as possible before the wastewater treatment plant upgrade occurs, so the same measurements can be made afterward as this data cannot be collected after the fact or replicated in the lab. The studies are underway now, and the results could help inform other large nutrient management actions in the Delta, as well as establish new methods that other large estuarine systems could adopt for similar situations. The science is intended to supplement existing monitoring and to help us gain a better understanding of nutrients and the food web in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta before this opportunity to study a large-scale management change is lost forever. With that, I encourage you to find out more about water quality in your own proverbial backyard, whether it be the Delta or otherwise. We can all learn more about how our actions and projects in our communities are impacting the environment. Here at the Delta Science Program, this means finding more ways to support and use new science so that we can better understand and manage our impacts to the Earth. For more information, please visit our website, deltacouncil.ca.gov. Thanks for joining me.